spatial temporal di uh, dimensions, this is the trajectory that the object will be following. Now, this direction is what I mean by spatial temporal orientation. I have uh, a doubt on this because this is imperative to know uh, in the future slides. Okay, cool. So, based on this definition of spatial temporal, temporal uh, orientations, we are going to look at how actions or human actions are split up into spatial temporal orientations. So, what I mean over here is every action, like if I simply do a jumping jack action, this action can be broken down or can be decomposed into a number of energy, um, like spatial temporal energies. By spatial temporal energies, what I mean is, l let me explain this figure uh, to you guys. So, if this is my query video, this is the energy decomposition of this query video. Now, if you look at, I don't know if this is visible. Okay, so, the, uh, I mean, like, what I'm basically doing here is I am splitting my uh, my video into seven constituent. Uh, Spatial temporal energies, where left, right, up, down, static, flicker, and lack of structure. Let me explain each of these. Now, the left spatial temporal energy decomposition will consist of will consist of all motion being performed by this guy, which is oriented in the leftward direction. And you should also know that the like in these energy representations, the brighter a particular action looks, the more energy it has. So if you look at just if you look at this square. And if you look at the action being performed there, you will see that every time there is a part, every time when there is a part of his body which is moving towards the left, you have, uh, I mean, the corresponding part brightens up in this figure. Is that is that evident? Uh, I, I'm not sure if you guys from the back can see it. Yes. Okay. Yes, so this is, so, so, I mean, left is just one of the examples. The other orientation we are looking at is right, which does the exact same thing, but it. Uh, but the only difference being it, uh, what do you call it, decomposes only the motion that is uh, oriented in the rightward direction. Similarly, you have up, down, static, flicker, and lack of structure. Now, right, left, up, down is pretty self explanatory. What I mean by static is static energy is the kind of energy that is uh, that belongs to those objects with a, which are static. So, anything that is moving is going to appear dark, and everything that is not is going to appear bright. Flicker is uh, flicker energy basically consists of all those energies that uh, occur because of let's say if you're uh, shooting a video with a very small uh, with a low frame rate. So if I move my hand from you know if I move my hand this way, uh, like when I'm actually seeing the video, I'm going to see my hand in this position, then in this position, and in this position. There is a flicker involved in motion. So that energy uh, basically represents. Uh, I mean. That spatial temporal orientation represents energy caused because of flicker motion, and uh, lack of structure is, uh, is is one concept which I'm not really clear about. But it basically deals with uh, parts in uh, parts in the video which uh, lack definite uh, structure. Like if you if you have a video with just white noise in it, the entire video will glow up because there is there is no structure uh, prevalent in that video. So you get this by frame wise keeping. Uh, no, uh, I get this by performing, um, not not performing exactly, but I use three-dimensional third derivative Gaussian filters to separate uh, filters in uh, different directions. I'm sorry, I think I didn't give you uh, copies of my thesis, but uh, technical details about this is mentioned in uh, page 24 and page 24, section 3.1. Yes, this method will fail if I have camera motion. This method independently will fail if I have okay, camera motion. Okay, so you, you have a constraint. There yeah, there is a constraint on the spotting, but when you are talking about banking, like spotting is just the the constitute. I mean, spotting just provides the infrastructure for for the actual yeah. bank. But on on a large scale, it, uh, like ca uh, moving cameras does not really create a big problem for the action bank. It will for the action spotting though. So this is basically what we split up every action into. But now, in the action bank, when you when you train those bus pairs for, for each action, what do you consider that those actions? For example, if you're training uh, videos, uh, they all contain any uh, some uh, camera motion. Mm -hmm. Do you ever consider to mitigate those motions or do you estimate those motions? Uh, I mean, I haven't really done 
done that explicitly, but uh, like let's say when, I, when I've been testing on UCF 50, uh, one of the classes that is diving always involves mo like, like moving camera. So basically there's a person who is jumping around on the springing board, he goes this way and goes all the way down into the water. Now the camera is never stationary, it's always, it's constantly moving. And I also have examples of diving where the camera is not moving. So, I mean, the way I would like to explain that is by having like a mix of both moving cameras and non-moving cameras, there is some, uh, you know, similarity that is seen between uh, th the bank representations of both these actions. So, uh, do, you, do you get a drift of what I'm saying? Basically, yeah. actually, you mean there, there is not significant camera motion to the theory, right? No, UCF 50 has quite a bit of yeah, that. Yeah, general the, the action band right uh, is, is the action band capable given that those kind of uh, yes yes of absolutely the sheer fact that we are considering uh, <laughs> examples of camera motion non-camera motion uh, difference in viewpoint difference in scale different in, difference in the subject performing the action is is good enough to cancel out those effects in which there is uh, you know let's say camera motion or a difference in scale is that is that so the best explanation to that I guess the, the, the thing to add is simply that the action bank is relying on these, the ability of this template-based action spotting method to provide a, a, a simple feature representation on which to learn further. So if in the database, in your training database, there are examples that involve someone pitching from the left and someone pitching from the right or large camera motion, that as long as that's representative of the population that you're going to be training on, uh -huh. then the action bank will simply build on top of that. Oh, okay. But if all, all of your training data has no camera motion, uh -huh. and then you want to apply it in a setting where there's camera motion, then action, then it won't, it won't so suffice. action bank is more like a large, um, well-organized data set for training, so that you can train your... Uh, well, I don't know if I would say that. So. In some sense, you could think of it that way, uh, in the sense that Action Bank will rely on template-based detectors, right? So your Action Bank uh, benefits if, in your bank of templates, yeah. you cover the range of actions you want to want to think will be rep seen. Mm -hmm. uh, but given a standard representation, um, of say a bank of so he has two hundred and five elements in the Action Bank, uh, and he'll talk about this later, I guess. Is in an experiment to see how important is the size of the action bank. How, how important is it that you have all examples of running left, running right, things like that, uh, to handle all of UCF's ports. So we reduce the size of the action bank and randomly sample what elements are in it. And we show that, and this, this was seen also in objects as well as actions, that uh, simply representing detectors at a higher level of, of feature, you, you somehow this is, we don't claim to understand the psychology behind this or the psychophysics behind this, you can do, uh, do better than if you use only low-level data. And I understand in this way, so for the action bank, for each action, we can collect data from data, uh, different database. Yeah. So put them together and okay. you know, generalize it. Okay. Yeah. You could even have random motions, which is something we've talked about only recently. Oh. And it's not a part of this work, but just kind of synthesizing a ball moving left or a ball moving right, things like that. It's still salient, high-level uh, actions that you might want to put in the action bank. So here's a case where uh, you're looking for these uh, left, right, this salient direction using your working filters. How how uh, sensitive would this be to sort of rotation of camera? Or yeah, this, this method is very sensitive to rotation of camera because if the camera moves, although things in the scene are seen, are, are 